Yesterday we we discussed the Buddhist art of life. The art of life of how to live life without requiring a self. The art of living without self. Today we will talk about the way of that art. A life without self is much better than death. Some people when they hear about selfless selfless life wonder what value it has or isn't it would be or think that it would be just as well to be dead. So one should consider the the benefits of a life without self. For example, when life is free of self, there is no no death. One knows no death when death has no meaning. This is one benefit. So life without self is much better than death. With out self, one can still be. One can still be in any way that is one needs to be. <clears throat> there is still being. There is still living. Without self, there is still having the various things that are necessary. There are all the forms of doing which are which need to be done. Even the kinds of doings that make up ordinary life with homes and families and jobs. Even the doing of reproduction, reproducing. Without self, there can even be reproducing and relating all the relationships and connections. Without self, there can be all these things and none of it will be dukkha. None of it will be suffering if there is no self. So to be with out self is the highest art <clears throat> or the supreme art for the sake of supreme life, the highest level of life, one that is beyond all problems, a life that knows no suffering. Now what we're calling art here is usually called <clears throat> usually called Dhamma. The, this supreme art is nothing other than Dhamma. Without Dhamma there can be no art. And without Dhamma none of this is possible. What we've just been talking about Without Dhamma, all being becomes painful. If there's no Dhamma, whatever we are is a source of pain and difficulty and misery for us. Whatever we have, whatever we possess, any kind of having becomes burdensome and stressful for us. Any kind of living becomes difficult. All forms of doing are tiresome and, and hassles for us without Dhamma. And even reproduction, sex, 
without dhamma, sex becomes a big problem. It creates all kinds of anxieties and competition, possessiveness, manipulation, and so on. So without dhamma, everything becomes painful. Without dhamma, anything becomes a basis for dukkha. But with dhamma, with dhamma, there can be life without any of that. There can be the being, having, living, doing, relating, but without the pain, without the heaviness and hassle. That is the supreme art. This sentence we've been using is rather difficult to, to understand. To live without self, living without self, is a statement in, in Dhamma language. It's something which is understood by the peop- those who know and understand Dhamma. And it's spoken in the way these, these people speak, living without self. What it means is to live without attaching to anything as self. When we, <clears throat> when living, yet not clinging to anything as me or mine, this is what we're talking about. There is this life with a body and mind. When there is not, when there is no attachment or clinging to this body as being me or I or mine, when there is no attachment to this mind, this heart, as being self, as me, as mine. When neither body nor mind, when none of life is attached to as self, this is the supreme art. But there's still life. Notice that there's living goes on. There's life, but there's no, no self, no attachment to self. Now what we call self, whatever anyone calls self, is false. That it's not a real self. Although we say self, self, I, I, it's not a real self. This, it's merely a concept or a misconcept an illusion that some this or that is a self. And so we need to correct this misconception. We need to straighten it out. To realize that this self, this I, is merely a concept and nothing more that there's no identity of self or essence of self or reality of self behind the concept. To see it as just a concept and nothing more. One no longer needs, then one stops attaching to it as being real, as being really me, the real me. one can then stop attaching to it. When one stops attaching to this concept of self, then all the dukkha, all the heaviness that this attachment brings will then disappear and then life becomes free. 
When life is free in this way, there is just life. There is the body, natural and simple. There is the mind, functioning properly. There's merely body and mind. There's no, no need for a third thing, some self or soul, to be clung to. Just the two are enough for life. Life gets on just fine, fine with, with body and mind. We don't need anything extra. As you can remember from yesterday, one extreme view is the insistence that there is self, there is self, everything is self, that there are these lasting, even eternal selves. That's one extreme. The other extreme is that there is nothing, that nothing exists, nothing ever did exist. There's just the view of nihilism is the other extreme. But in the middle, not quite between, but above these two wrong views is the right one, which is that there is this concept of self. We say self, self, self. There is this concept of self, but it isn't a real, a real self. You can use the concept, but you can't find any essence or real self that can be clung to as self. This is called the middle way or the middle teaching. There is a self which is not a real self, the self which is not self. To see that it's, there's merely this concept, but no real self. It's time now to look at where this, this misconception arises from. Where does this misunderstanding of self, this misconcept, where does it come from? The concept of self arises out of the, the ignorant or the ignorant feeling, feelings of being positive and being negative. Whenever there's this a feeling of something being positive or something being negative, that is inherently ignorant. This is not feeling that comes from seeing things as they are. It comes from fundamental misunderstanding. Once there is feeling of positive, this develops into a positive ego. When there is feeling of negative, this grows into a negative ego. The positive ego wants the positive, wants more positive, wants to have it and keep it. The negative ego wants to get rid of the negative, wants to get rid of or destroy or whatever. So once these feelings of positive and negative occur, they lead to different forms of ego, positive egos and negative egos. So this in, in very simple terms is how the self, how the ego gets stirred up or gets created. When there are none of these feelings of 
positive and negative. Then the ego. There's no positive and negative ego. There's no self. When there's no self, life has no problems. There's no nothing heavy about life. And then we say that life is free. Life is liberated. Everything is fine. Everything is cool. This is the meaning of liberation. When there's nothing positive or negative. When there's no ego or self. There's the the body and the mind. That's that's all that's actually present. And in this body, there is a nervous system, and the mind or consciousness is able to experience things through the nervous system. Or is able to experience the information received by the nervous system. All around are various objects: sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, which are stimulating the nervous system constantly. Every time the nervous system is stimulated in some way, that that then is experienced by the mind. When these things are being, when the nervous system is stimulated in one way or another, and is experienced. Then, due to ignorance, this is distinguished as being positive or negative. This is how things work. Things are are distinguished: positive and negative. And so, thus, the feelings of positive and negative arise. Now, all of this happens purely naturally. It doesn't require any self, soul, spirit, ghost, whatever, for these things to operate. They're merely natural mechanisms, and so things function in this way. Just because there's a body with a nervous system and mind, with these. They're able to happen with these two things, without any need for a third thing. In ancient times, people who didn't understand, who had no knowledge of what we're speaking about, believed that there were, there are three things: body, mind. And some third thing that has been called a soul, a spirit, Atman, self, Ata, or whatever. They believe that there, if there was experience, there had to be something special behind it all, and this gave rise to the belief. In some self or soul. Later, when Buddhism came along and said that, look, there's there's really no self involved in all of this. The nervous system can be stimulated, and the mind naturally experiences that, and then all the other things that happen. This is just happening through body and mind. That's all. The mind experiences these things. There's no 
there's no self or soul in there that to do it, to experience all this. But they were unable to understand or accept this because the belief in self was so, was so firm. But in Buddhism, it's, Buddhism asks or encourages us to just look. Look at things in the most, to observe them. And see that fundamentally there's just the body, stimulation by the various sense objects, and then mind is aware, mind knows those experiences. This happens quite naturally, automatically. That's all there is. Now there's a crucial natural fact that you would do well to observe. That if there is no stimulation of the nervous system, no stimulation of the eyes, ears, nose, etc., feeling or vetana won't happen. There's no feeling without stimulation of the nervous system. However, once the the nervous system is stimulated, whether by the eyes, the ears, or whatever, or through the eyes, ears, or whatever. You can't help it. You can't stop it. Vedana happens. You just can't stop it. This, there is feeling as soon as the nervous system is stimulated. Now here what we're calling feeling or vetana is, is very simple. There's basically just two kinds, positive and negative. If the stimulation of the nervous system is comfortable, soothing, attractive, um, agreeable, then that's called Sukhavetana, or just pleasure. If, however, the stimulation of the nervous system is uncomfortable, disagreeable, painful, that's negative, negative feeling. So once the nervous system is stimulated, we can't help it. There will be either positive or negative feeling. Now once we see this fact that without any stimulation of the nervous system, without any sense activity, there is no feeling, then we can start to see that On the other hand, once there is stimulation, first we see what happens when there's nothing stimulated. Then we can watch the simu stimulation carefully, clearly. That if when the nervous system is stimulated, there's, then there's some kind of feeling. If this, the stimulation is soothing, comfortable, then it's positive feeling. If it's uncomfortable, it's negative feeling or painful. Now, if the mind is ignorant, if the mind experiencing this doesn't understand what's going on, then these positive and negative feelings give rise to liking, and disliking. The ignorant mind says, this is positive, 
the ignorant mind takes this to be negative. There's first just the feeling of positive and negative. And then because of ignorance, the mind gets into liking and disliking, loving and hating. This happens only because of the mind's ignorance. If, however, there was proper knowledge of how this is working, there is wisdom, then the mind just sees, oh, it's just feeling. It's just feeling. There's nothing positive nor negative about this feeling. It just happens. It's just a natural response to to the sense activity. And that's all. And then there's no, if there is wisdom in the mind, it doesn't need to, there's no need for liking in disliking and the ego and suffering that comes from liking and disliking. In the, for the embryo, when we were all embryos or just fetuses in our mother's wombs, at first there was, there wasn't really a nervous system. There wasn't a functioning nervous system. And therefore there was no feeling and there was no liking and disliking, so there was no, no dukkha. But once the, the fetus developed enough that there was, once the nervous system developed, at some point there became a, an infant with a working nervous system. And then when that nervous system, fully functional nervous system was stimulated, then feelings could happen. When the feelings occurred, then they were discriminated into the categories of positive and negative. This is the starting point. This is the basis for dukkha, for suffering in all religions. This is the starting point of all suffering. When the feelings are discriminated. This is, so in Buddhism we give a lot of importance to the vetana, the feelings. When there is no feeling, there's no positive and negative. And so there's nothing to get, to make an ego out of. And so there's nothing, there's no problems in life. Without ego, there's no problems, there's no heaviness, there's no strife, tension, stress no dukkha. But as soon as there is feeling, if the mind is ignorant, it discriminates positive, negative, liking, disliking. And then the ego and all the problems, the heaviness, the, the conflict and turmoil of ego is born. So we say that Vetana is the starting point of suffering. And we give a lot of attention to these, these feelings, the natural feelings of positive and negative towards sense experience when our nervous systems are stimulated. This is something to we must understand through our own observation and experience. The fetus grows, the nervous system develops, and then the fetus or the infant 
is born. When the infant is born, its nervous system begins to function. And that means it begins, begins to experience the world, begins to experience things. For example, one of the first things to experience is the mother's breast and, and milk, which is naturally delicious and good for the infant. So this is, this is felt to, so then positive feeling to drink the milk is, is comforting for the infant. So positive feeling arises. But if something else gets in its mouth, it might be uncomfortable or painful and the infant cries. Or if the infant opens its eyes and it sees something soothing or attractive, it smiles. If it sees something unattractive or frightening, it cries. And so there's the custom of putting all kinds of beautiful and soothing things around the baby's crib. And even to place soft, soothing music and to make sure that everything smells fragrant and nice, flowery, and then to keep the baby in warm, soft clothing in blankets so that there's nothing but soothing, pleasing stimulations. And so at this point, the baby is learning what pleases it and what displeases it. I like this, or liking, disliking. And so positive and negative starts right here with the liking and disliking. The feelings, the just the basic feelings of agreeable, disagreeable, comfortable, uncomfortable. Start is first, and then, then the mind experiences these, and then there's liking and disliking, positive and negative. Now the mind that experiences this is just the same ordinary mind just the element of consciousness which is inherent in life. There's no need for a self or spirit or something to experience these feelings to concoct the positive and negative. It happens, it happens naturally. This is all something that we need to study. It's very important for us to scientifically, systematically study how our senses work, to study the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind sense. How these sense, sense what these senses are, how they are stimulated by their objects, forms, so, um, sounds, odors, flavors, touches, and mental objects. And then to study feeling, these positive and negative, pleasant and unpleasant reactions when the nervous system is, is stimulated. So we study the nervous system and the feelings that arise dependent on the nervous system. We study it very carefully and we see that this happens without requiring any, any self. There are merely natural mechanisms. When the once the nervous system is stimulated, 
then there are the feelings, positive and negative. Because of ignorance, the mind takes the positive feelings to be good. Whenever there is positive feeling, we say good, good, good. And when there are, the feeling is negative or un, when it's unpleasant, we say evil, bad, evil. This is how good and evil arises. It's how the ignorant mind labels these positive and negative feelings. So this is how this, this problem of good and evil, which will, will trouble us for our entire lives, usually, occurs. When another name for all of this is original sin or eternal sin. When there's taking just the ordinary feelings to be good, to be evil, this can be considered the original sin. If one doesn't understand this, one will not be able to and suffering. If one does not understand this regarding things as good and evil, then it's not possible to quench dukkha, to end suffering. But if one sees this and understands it, if one sees what this so-called original sin is and how it works, then one can, then one is able to end suffering. Now we spend our whole lives hungry for the positive. We hunger for the positive and we're afraid of the negative. We hate the negative and are afraid of it. So we spend our lives being tormented and burdened by our hunger for the positive and our hatred and fear of the negative. For example, when you receive a telegram, as we open the telegram, our hands shake because we're being, there's both the desire for the positive, our hunger for something positive, and our hatred and fear of something negative. And so our hands shake as we, we open the telegram, being kind of burned on both sides by both positive and negative. When there's this positive and negative, there's no peace. When there's no the, because the mind is being shaken and rattled by this positive and negative. There's no peace. The mind isn't calm and still. And so there's no real happiness. There's just the, the hunger for the positive and the hatred and fear of the negative. There is peace. There is real happiness only when the, there is no positive and negative. When the mind is free of this hunger and fear, then it is calm, quiet, and peaceful. And this peacefulness is blissfulness or happiness. The way to find this is to to be free of this positive and negative, to be, to be free of the hunger and the fear. When we, when we take a test, when as students or civil servants or whatever, when we take a test, as we take the test, we are tormented all the time by both 
positive and negative, by our hunger for positive results and our fear for negative results, or when we do any work in this world, we are tormented simultaneously by our hunger for positive results, for getting something good from our work, and our fear of any negative or bad results. For, mo for most of us, just about everything we do is tormented by both our hunger for the positive and our fear of the negative. And this happens over and over again in just about everything we do. But we should look carefully and we will see that sometimes, occasionally, if just by accident or coincidence, there will be, there will be moments when the mind is free of this, this torment. Now, we're not talking about just when the torment is relatively subtle, when it's not happening on the usual crude level. We're talking about when the moments where there's no positive and no negative in the mind at all. And you'll see that those moments are the moments when there is real peace when there is genuine peace and happiness. That moment, the mind, when the mind is, when there's no problems, you'll find that that's the moment when you feel there's no sense of anything being a problem or any burden. Everything is free, wide open, light. We should study these moments because they're very important. They show us what is possible. Or maybe because we've begun to understand how things, these things work and have begun to practice according to this understanding so that there are, there are more of these moments where the mind is free of positive and negative, no longer tormented by the hunger, hatred, and fear. And then we see, we can begin to see what real peace is, what real happiness is. But in our modern world, we've we're totally infatuated with the positive. Entire nations and economies are now dedicated to the positive. Our economies produce nothing but consumer junk to, notice we call them consumer goods, consumer positives in order to feed this hunger. But the hunger, there's always this fear that it won't be good enough or that it'll break or get lost. And so now we're so dedicated to this, the positive, our hunger for it is so obsessive that it keeps us plunged in this torment of of hunger, hatred, and fear. But if we can start to understand what's taking place and how these things work, then we can begin to practice. We can practice in a way so that we understand and instead of getting caught up into this positive and negative, the liking and disliking, the hunger, hatred, and fear. One can see it as it is and, and allow the mind to remain peaceful.
the peacefulness is there if we'll let it be. So it's very, very important to study these things if we seek peace if we seek <clears throat> if we seek an end to to suffering these things we're talking about don't depend on any religion they don't belong to any religion these are just what ha happens naturally all the religions in one way or another aim to help us deal with this situation. Some of the religions talk about it in very human terms, very in terms of selves and egos. And this makes it very under, very difficult to understand the real underlying mechanisms because there's all these talk about selves and souls and all that. Other religions talk in very abstract dhamma, technical dhamma language. And this can be very difficult to understand. But still, all the religions are in their way aiming to help us be free of suffering. The suffering of this hunger, hatred and fear regarding the positive and the negative. And if we can understand and end or quench this positive and negative, this is the meaning of, of freedom or salvation in all the religions. We put it in much more brief terms. <clears throat> when the mind when the mind is above, beyond, all positive and negative. In Buddhism that is called Nibbana. That is called the realization of Nibbana. <clears throat> In Christianity it's called to be united with God. When the mind is beyond all influence of positive and negative. You can call it Nibbana. One can call it union with God. You can call it what you want. You, you can belong to whatever religion you want. You don't have to, to change them. We ask only one thing, to be above, beyond all of the power of positive and negative. That's, that's all we ask. Now we're talking about this in order to show you that both positive and negative equally in the <clears throat> equally cause suffering. The positive makes us hungry. And this hunger is suffering, is dukkha. The negative leads to hatred and fear, which is also suffering. So both positive and negative are identical in the sense that they both equally cause suffering. Now if, but if one is above, if the mind is beyond this positive and negative, which means just removing, removing the positive and the negative from the mind, then there is, there is no suffering. So by just this one little thing, by merely removing positive and negative, one one has all the religions, all the great and marvelous religions will be, you'll have them all, whichever you prefer, or the whole, the whole kit and caboodle of them.
just by removing this positive and negative. Now, we're not speaking just out of a kind of nationalism, but we'd like to talk a little bit about Asia. To the furthest west of Asia the, were the Jews in Palestine, this extreme western edge of Asia. And there, very long ago, the Jews had the, the deep understanding that one should not attach to good and evil. This appears in the very first pages of the Jewish Bible. If you don't realize this, then you ought to go and study it. But at the very beginning of the Bible is the teaching to not attach to good and evil. On the other extreme of Asia, in the Far East, in China, Taoism taught essentially the same thing, to not attach to yin and yang, yin and yang, or positive and negative. And then in the middle, in India, both Hinduism and Buddhism were teaching roughly the same thing. In Hinduism, not to attach to punya and papa, which could be good and, and evil. We could translate them. And Buddhism, not attached to Guson and Aguson. Guson is what is wholesome and good. Aguson is what is unwholesome, unhealthy. Or in short, positive and negative. Over 2,000 years ago, this most profound, this is the most profound understanding humanity has come across. And it was understood across Asia to more than 2,000 years ago. Unfortunately, since then, things have deteriorated because of steady material development. People have been more and more distracted away from this wisdom and have more and more forgotten it and ignored it. But this 2,000 something years ago, this knowledge was known across throughout Asia. In Europe, this was never seems to have been known. The Greeks never spoke of this. The philosophy of the Greeks was primarily concerned with material things with education and politics and material science. And so the philosophy of the Greeks is rather childish, rather immature. Although it's quite useful for dealing with material things and so it has its, its use. Actually, it's quite a shame that the, these two branches or approaches never quite met. Because with the, the Western, the Western um, facility, which is still very dualistic and all that, for dealing with material things and science and politics and economics, and the Asian understanding of, of the mind and of the highest truth, the truth that, that one should not attach to positive and negative, that good and evil are not worth attaching to. If these two 
could meet, had met, or would meet, then we could we could have the material progress. We could make use of these material goods without attaching to them as positive and negative. So this is a little history of Asian Asian thought. This that once upon a once was well understood that positive and negative should not be attached to, but unfortunately in our heavily developed world this wisdom has deteriorated until in most places it's forgotten and ignored and people have no clue about it. Now we must ask you straight, have we gotten worse than our ancestors? Are we worse? Have we, have things deteriorated since our ancestors' times? Chasing after the positive is not peaceful. There's nothing calm or peaceful about it. The negative disturbs and frightens us. There's nothing peaceful about it. So what have we got nowadays? Are we worse than our ancestors? Please consider this carefully, sincerely. If you do, you'll understand the situation that we're in. Now we've got all kinds of machines that are designed to produce positive things, things that will give us or bring us or the positive will make us positive. We've got many of these machines, whole systems and organizations and institutions set up for just this one purpose to give us the positive, more and more positive. But the thing is, the more we hunger for the positive, the more we fear the negative. The, the larger, the stronger our hunger for the positive. <clears throat> There's, and the more we've got the positive, the greater we fear that we'll lose it or that it'll just diminish a little bit. Our, our hunger is so strong that we have great fear that our, our positive will just drop a little bit. The standard of living has to keep going up. Nobody is willing to let it go down to a reasonable level. So this is the world we have, one where our, we're, we become more and more trapped by the positive and the negative. And so there's more and more turmoil, competition. There's, there's, no, there's no rest. There's so much hunger and fear that nobody has a chance to rest, always running around somewhere, trying to get some more positive, afraid we'll, we'll get some negative. We're deceived and deluded by this positive and negative. These things, the positive and negative, trick us so much that we're very confused. We're so tricked by the, the negative that we've be, or by the positive, the positive tricks us so much that we're addicted to it without even knowing it. We've, we've got a very strong addiction to the positive without even a clue that this has happened. 
Nowadays, people are very afraid, very concerned about drugs, such as heroin. But nobody's concerned about the far greater, more powerful and worse addiction of addiction to the positive. We're afraid of, the, of nuclear bombs, of nuclear war. But nobody's afraid of the far more dangerous and present fear of the negative. What's truly frightening, what's really causing us problems right now, is the negative and our fear of it. So in both the positive and the negative are our, our greatest problems today. So it's very appropriate that you have come here to find understanding about living above the positive and negative, coming here to with the purpose of knowing how to live free of the positive and the negative. The positive gives rise to ego, to self. The negative gives rise to self. When there's the, a positive self, it seeks more and more positive. So it becomes more and more infatuated with, more and more addicted to the negative or to the positive. The negative ego more and more fears and hates the negative. And so it becomes more and more attached to the negative, more and more detached, you could say. And this negative ego grows and grows, more and more obsessed and afraid of the negative. When there's this obsessions and addictions, it makes life very troublesome, full of problems, confused, complicated, stressful. So it's time to just throw it all away, to find some way to just throw away all this positive and negative, all the self, all the ego to toss it away and be free. This is the, the art of living, the understanding that allows us to throw away all this positive and negative, all the self, all the ego, in order to be free. Now we come to the one single word that expresses the heart of the problem. This word is attachment, attachment. When it's, when there's attachment to the positive, there's attachment in a positive way in order to have more, to get more, to keep. When there's then there's attachment in a negative way to the negative, to get rid of or fear or something. You, can see, you should see that attachment to the negative is equal to attachment to the positive. Don't think that attachment is just to things you love. There is just as much attachment to negative things, the things you don't like, the things you hate, the things you are afraid of. Positive and negative are the basis for attachment. This is the core of our problem. This is what we must find a means to remove. To carry a load of bricks is very heavy. 
to carry a load of diamonds is just as heavy. Why bother carrying either? Why go around lugging a bunch of bricks or a bunch of diamonds? Why not just drop them and be light and free? If we attach to the positive, it's one kind of burden. Attaching to the negative is another kind of burden. Either way, they are heavy and troublesome. But we can just let go and be free. Why bother attaching to positive and negative? So it's, it's very good, it's very correct that you have come here in order to practice mindfulness, to practice mindfulness in the system called anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing in and out. Through practicing in this way, you will develop very good mindfulness. And then with that mindfulness, one pays attention to things, to the things in one's own life, until one understands them. And so this mindfulness leads to understanding or wisdom, the kind of wisdom we've been talking about the last couple days. And then mindfulness with this will keep, keep the mind or keep life on the right track. And there will be, and then through this practice you will develop samadhi or the stable, focused, concentrated mind, which provides the strength and energy to do this, to keep the mind on the right track. So through practicing correctly, there's mindfulness, wisdom, and concentration. When we have these, when these are sufficient and strong enough, then there's no attachment to the positive and the negative. When there's no attachment, there's nothing heavy. There's no ego, no self. And so there's no suffering, no dukkha. And then one is free. One is liberated. That liberation is, is to dwell in Nibbana, to live in Nibbana, or to live with God. Whether your goal is to live in Nibbana or to live with God, your, your wish will be fulfilled in this way. So it is that we can live above all influence of positive and negative. We can be, have, live, do all the things that need to be done as are appropriate. Everything that is necessary and proper, correct, can be done, had, related to, concerned, and so on. If there is, if the mind is beyond, above all influence of positive and negative, then there will be no, no dukkha, no pain, no suffering. For those of you, you, most of you here are, are lay people. And that means that you can even reproduce the species. And if the mind knows how to, to be above the influence of positive and negative, then even that can be done without any suffering, without any dukkha. And what, what is there better in life than that? To be able to do 
all the things that need to be done to be, to have, to relate, to concern, to live all the things that are necessary and right, even to reproduce without suffering, without dukkha. It may seem rather strange, but when there is, when there is life without self, when there is life without any self or ego, then there is no death. When there is the self, when there is some self, then there is death. But when there is no self, there is nothing to die. It may seem kind of strange, but this is this is where, where deathlessness or in, immortality is found. When there is no self, there is no death. So if one has the wisdom that everything is not self, that there is life, but this life is not really self. One has this wisdom, then there's no way for dukkha to arise. There is no, no death. One has this wisdom and then has the mindfulness to live in and with this wisdom. If there is always the mindfulness to, to keep the mind aware, that there is nothing worth attaching to as self, that there is nothing worth grabbing onto as self, then no suffering can arise. So living with mindfulness, having this mindfulness is central. If we have time, we'll speak later about having this mindfulness. But for today, our time is up, and we'll have to finish the talk. So finally, thank you for being patient listeners. Um, if we hadn't have chosen the, the best time of day, but we chose the time when the mind is most open, fresh, and receptive. So thank you for coming. We hope that even if you came here as tourists, you'll be able to leave as pilgrims with something, the most valuable thing in life, in your backpacks. So thank you. We'll see you again later in the retreat. <laughs>